This is a public health announcement brought to you by Heather Shepard. The Primal Pioneer. Live an outdoor life. This is the Primal Pioneer Podcast, a show dedicated to helping you achieve optimal health by making radical lifestyle dietary, and environmental shifts to support forward movement with your health. I'm your host, Heather Shepard, medical health practitioner, gut health specialist, and homeopathic doctor in training. When I was 23 years old, I suffered a TBI, otherwise known as a traumatic brain injury. This shifted my life from being a super athletic type A kind of person to being sidelined from physical activity for nearly 12 years. During that time, I tried every modality under the sun, desperately yearning, trying, and hoping to get better. It wasn't until I stepped outside of the conventional medical model and even much of the alternative medical model that I saw real lasting progress with my health. Today, I help thousands of people overcome both acute and chronic ailments using my nature and science-based radical approach to health, which targets the most important yet most overlooked aspects of health and wellness. Today's episode, I reveal my five hacks to eating healthy Mexican cuisine. Today, most of our modern Mexican food, especially here in the States, is chock full of unhealthy ingredients, which really does our body a disservice. And it also does a huge disservice to this remarkably healthy, delicious cuisine. If you love Mexican food as much as I do, and want to learn how to upgrade not only the health status of your Mexican cuisine experience, but the diverse and amazing tastes that this food has to offer, then this episode is for you. Enjoy. Hi, everyone. Welcome back and Happy New Year. Today, I'm stoked to dive into the first episode of 2021, talking all about Mexican food. It is one of my favorite cuisines. Those of you who follow me on social media, on Instagram, likely know this because every other post I share tends to be of some sort of Mexican-related cuisine picture, whether it's tacos or chilies or smoked meats made for tacos, fresh fish, grilled, etc. My feed is pretty full of those things. And it's because Mexican food's one of my favorite cuisines. You know, and it emphasizes some of my favorite food groups. Okay, get ready for this one. Chilies, cacao, fresh seafood, and salsas. Yes, those are among my favorite food groups. And however, most people in the States, they think of Mexican food in a different way, okay? It's not this like fresh chilies, cacao, fresh seafood, you know, we don't typically think of Mexican cuisine in this way. We've turned this cuisine into an absolute shit show when it comes to our health and when it comes to really appreciating and respecting the food, the delicious food, the culture in this region, right? Because today, most people think of Mexican food, at least in the West, as this like fried tortilla smothered in a boatload of cheese and oil topped with canned vegetables and raw like pale lettuce and raw spinach and you know raw cabbage and this is super unappealing and so not only is it unappealing but it literally tastes horrific so maybe your taste buds have you know, been used to eating that kind of Mexican cuisine. And I'm going to teach you in this episode, five hacks to eating healthy Mexican food so that not only can you appreciate the flavors, the diversity of the foods and flavors and spices that go into this cuisine, but also so you can eat it in a super healthy way. So you don't have to say, oh, I feel like Mexican tonight and feel like you're cheating on your diet or, you know, whatever you want to call it, because you kind of revert to the way that we've been trained and taught and offered how to eat Mexican food here in the West. There is so much to this cuisine. It has so much to offer with regard to not only taste, but to our health as well. 
And so let's dive in right here to my five hacks to eating healthy Mexican food. Because if you do these five things, literally, your food will taste better, you'll enjoy it more, and it's going to support your health in really, really beneficial ways. So let's dive right in and start with number one, lard over vegetable oil. So some people, if you're just new to following me and listening to this, you might be thinking, Heather, what are you talking about? Lard, that's so fattening, <laughs> right? And we've been trained to think about saturated fats as bad. They clog arteries. They cause heart disease. They make us fat. This is a huge misconception when it comes to our health. I've got a pretty good episode out. It's called something about the key to overcoming clogged arteries or the truth about cholesterol and clogged arteries. I think that's it. I would encourage you to listen to that episode if you're still playing into the mindset that saturated fats and cholesterol are bad and dangerous for our health. In fact, they're super supportive to our health. It's the vegetable oil movement. Once that came into play, this is when we started to see all the clogged artery mess come into play. And so we have made this swap because lard, lard for those of you who don't know, I'm sure many of you know, but it's, it's literally the fat from pigs, okay? And there's a couple different kinds of lard. There's just, there's regular lard from the pigs and there's a leaf lard. I love leaf lard. I get leaf lard when I can because leaf lard comes from the fat that surrounds the pig's kidneys, okay? And this fat is particularly high in vitamin D. It's one of our best food sources of vitamin D, leaf lard. Now, lard is also rich in vitamin D, but leaf lard is even richer in this crucial, crucial nutrient. And so, when it comes to making our fat choices, you know, what kind of fats we're going to use to make our food, we always want to think traditional. How would they do this traditionally, you know, before vegetable oils were invented? Because vegetable oils are a man-made modern invention. Lard is not man-made. Okay, Crisco is because it contains all of those vegetable oils and it's super processed and hydrogenated and so forth, right? It kind of looks like lard, you know, if you don't really know what lard looks like. It's this pure, like, white as snow color and it's thick, almost like the thickness of coconut oil, but it's smooth. It doesn't have any of those bumps in it. It's super smooth and creamy and it has this really nice, delicate and mild flavor, okay? So you can literally use lard, you can use leaf lard to flavor, to cook your vegetables in, and you're not going to have a really huge, strong, overpowering flavor, such as if you were to use something like beef tallow or lamb tallow, you know, those fats are really, really dense. They have a strong flavor. Lard is not the same doesn't produce that same strong flavor. It's more of this mild flavor. And it's the traditional fat that has been used in Mexico for years. It's been used in the States for years, especially before vegetable oils hit the scene. So what do I mean by vegetable oils? Anything literally that's liquid in a bottle, okay? No matter what the label says, it says it's heart healthy, it says it has omega-3s, it says it's paleo, it says it's keto. You have to get rid of all that stuff. It's just a marketing scheme to get you to buy the product. We have to actually look at how was this product made? Where did it come from? How many humans and machines did it take to make this food? When it comes to vegetable oils, it takes a lot of humans and machines to make these oils. So because you have to extract them and you have to press them from seeds and plant matter, and you have to heat them up to extract them. And these oils are rancid. They're toxic. They're very harmful to the cells and to the cell membranes. They're very, very pro-inflammatory. And these oils should be avoided no matter what you read in a book about them. And no matter what the nutrition or uh, marketing label says on the oil, if it says whole 30 approved, I don't, you know, it doesn't matter. That's just a marketing scheme to get you to buy it. 
we need to take a look at how many humans and machines did it take to make this product when it comes to vegetable oils such as canola, soy, sunflower, safflower, corn, even the paleo, avocado, almond, walnut oils, right? These oils that have been proclaimed as healthy, modern day and paleo and keto friendly. I have seen so many people experience issues, health issues after eating these oils and they're not good for our health. They're super destructive. They're destructive to the cell membranes. So when it comes to upgrading your Mexican food experience, I would highly encourage you to swap lard or leaf lard for the vegetable oils. Just omit them from your diet, no matter what cuisine you're cooking, your health will far much better, okay? And focus on the healthy grass-fed animal fats like lard, like leaf lard. I often use butter as well when making Mexican food. It's amazing, but lard can offer more of that milder flavor if you're making a sauce that requires some kind of like oil because you might have a Mexican cuisine cookbook and let's say it wants to show you how to make let's make a mole right this can seem like a hard sauce to make once you have it down it's pretty easy but usually in a lot of the sauces and a lot of the sauces that I'll get into here later in the episode they call for some kind of liquid vegetable oil you can often swap this in recipes, especially in mole recipes for lard. And I highly encourage you to do so. Lard is one of our richest dietary sources of vitamin D. It's not rancid, especially if you get the pasture raised stuff from a, a local farmer, maybe your own pig, somebody you really trust. Fat works. If you live in the States, they do a really great job of making some good quality lard and leaf lard. It has a mild, pleasant taste. And so I would highly recommend you swap the vegetable oils for lard, okay? Also, I want you to keep this in mind, no matter what food you're making, no matter what cuisine you're making, swapping saturated fats from animals, minimal processing, right? Especially the closer you get to the farmer. You know, if you have your own animals, you know a farmer, you go to your farmer's market, maybe they have butter, maybe they have goat butter, maybe they have lard or leaf lard. Go to your farmer's market, look for the farmer who's selling pork and say, hey, do you have any lard? Do you have any fat that I can make lard? Making lard, rendering your own lard is one of the easiest things you can do. You literally take the fat, you can even do this in your crock pot, place it in your crock pot on low. It will start to slowly melt into this liquid form. So you scoop that liquid into a jar, you know, through a cheesecloth, and you'll end up with a really, really amazing fat source that you can use to cook your Mexican cuisine. Highly recommend it. It's one of my favorite fats. It's definitely got the back seat and the it's been oh really poo pooed because of its quote unquote saturated fat content and animal fat content, which we've been told causes clogged arteries and high cholesterol levels and it's dangerous, but that's just not true, especially when you know how important saturated fats and cholesterol are to heart health, to the body, to cancer prevention, to detoxification. So Swap out your vegetable oils, go for the leaf lard or the lard. Okay, number two, organic corn, okay? Mexican cuisine has a lot of corn in it, especially corn tortillas, right? It's a staple. We're having tacos, we're having empanadas, we're having chips, corn chips, right? Okay, organic corn. You want to focus on organic corn, especially here in the States. You know, I think it's something like 95 plus percent of all corn in the United States is GMO. It's genetically modified. We don't want to be eating genetically modified corn. This is a really bad idea for our health for the health of our kids. You know, kids love what we often give kids chips all the time, right? You know, some kids can be finicky eaters. What do we do? Oh, here's the corn chips or chips in general, right? And so we want to make sure that if we choose this option to eat corn, I know some of you listening in might not do well with grains. Corn, by the way, is a grain. It is not a vegetable. 
the food industry, the conventional food industry, tries to convince you differently, telling you that if you eat corn syrup, you're really getting your vegetables in. However, corn is not a vegetable. It's a grain. And so what do we know about grains is they require special preparation. All grains do. Ancient cultures knew this, okay? Traditionally, corn tortillas were prepared by this long soaking process of the corn in what's called lime salts, okay? It's not actually lime, okay, but it's called lime salt. It's like a lime, referred to today as like a lime pickling salt. And so you need to soak the corn in this lime pickling salt in order to neutralize the anti-nutrients that are contained within corn. All grains contain anti-nutrients. Anti-nutrients basically mean that if you eat them and they're not prepared properly, you're going to be eating anti-nutrients. And what this does is it blocks the absorption of certain minerals and nutrients in your gut. So you actually will become nutrient deficient by eating improperly prepared grains. This is one of the biggest issues that we have modern day is that we put our kids and even adults that are eating all these grains that are improperly prepared. But again, we're going for the marketing scheme. It says whole wheat, says seven grain this, 43 grain that, you know, et cetera. We think it's good. We pull it off the shelf and here we go, right? However, grains need very special preparation. Usually this involves a long soaking process, sometimes a souring process in order to neutralize those anti-nutrients. So you don't end up creating nutrient deficiencies, which is a huge root cause of many health conditions today. We're actually blocking the absorption of certain minerals and nutrients like magnesium, like manganese, like zinc, etc., by eating improperly prepared grains. Corn, when you eat corn and it's not prepared properly, you're going to run up against and bump up against these anti-nutrient issues. This is why many people today cannot digest corn because it's simply not prepared in a traditional way. So there's actually a company out there who produces sprouted corn tortillas. This is more of an ideal option when it comes to, you know, making tacos or whatever you're going to use your tortillas for. Honestly, I use corn tortillas for making tacos, of course, but also for making corn chips. I make homemade corn chips by getting something like the sprouted corn tortillas and then sauteing them in grass-fed butter or lard and topping them with sea salt, and it'll be one of the healthiest corn chips that you can eat, okay? This is something I highly recommend if you're into Mexican cuisine, if you're into tortillas, if you're into, you know, corn chips. Of course, I don't recommend going overboard on corn products because many people modern day, our guts are a complete train wreck and we need a lot of healing. And so if we're eating a lot of these grains while our gut is a wreck, it could further fuel the issue. Okay. So I'm bringing this up though, because corn tends to be a main staple in Mexican cuisine. Some corn tortilla uh, processors today, they actually prepare corn tortillas in the traditional way using the lime pickling salt and organic corn. If you can find somebody who does this, or if you yourself are up for a challenge, <laughs> are up for making your own, then I would highly recommend this. It's something that I'm in the process of learning how to do myself. The first thing is you need good quality corn in order to make this. And when you are making your corn tortillas, if you're not grinding your own corn and pickling it, etc., look for masa harina because this has already been properly prepared with the lime pickling salt, okay? And so if you have the masa, you can make your own homemade corn tortillas, saute them in lard, right? You can cook them on low and slow so they're not super fried, okay? And this is a much healthier way to add corn tortillas, corn chips, etc., into your Mexican cuisine experience. And lastly, I'll finish this one with most corn chips in the store, they have been fried in vegetable oil. 
So you get this kind of health disaster when you eat corn chips at a restaurant or out of a bag from a store because you get improperly prepared corn and then you get vegetable oils on top of that. And this is super, super inflammatory. And I would highly recommend one, making your own homemade corn chips, two, making your own homemade corn tortillas using masa, okay? Or number three, look for the sprouted, organic sprouted corn tortillas in your health food store. And those have been properly prepared. If a grain is sprouted, that is one way to properly prepare it. Okay, let's move on to number three, homemade sauces and salsas. What does this mean? Homemade, this is not like semi-homemade, okay? <laughs> Remember that show on the Food Network growing up, it was called Semi-Homemade. Maybe that was just the name of it, Semi-Homemade. And it would use stuff like half out of a can and maybe like a fresh tomato from the grocery store. So she considered it semi-homemade because it was a little bit canned, a little bit homemade. I understand that not everybody has the time, energy, etc., to make everything from scratch all the time. I have something in my DNA that is like, Heather, make that thing from scratch, okay? And this like desire and drive to make everything from scratch. And I'm talking everything. So, you know, when it comes to sauces and salsas, if the more you can make it fresh and homemade and not like the semi-homemade thing, the better. But also I understand that not everyone has this desire to make everything homemade. Like for me, I want to make homemade chocolate and I want to make homemade corn tortillas. And I want to make, you know, like my partner and I just watched this show about homemade pasta and I have a Sicilian cultural background, right? My grandfather was Sicilian. And so I ate a lot of Italian food growing up. Love Italian food, love, love, love it. Ate so much of it growing up, right? And we ate a lot of really great Italian food. And so my grandfather who is no longer living, my Sicilian grandfather, he literally had this same thing in his blood where like everything had to be homemade. Talking about cannolis to pasta, making homemade pasta, making homemade ravioli, homemade sauce, things out of a can. We're talking about like ragu out of the can or those other canned sauces. That was like sacrilege. You couldn't bring that into our house. It would be like, bring that to the, to somebody else. Like, don't, don't bring it in the house. It's not allowed. You know, you'd be cussed out for a year if you brought in some kind of canned sauce into the house. So I think that something's in my blood that wants me to make everything homemade, but not only wants to, it's like I have this passion and desire to. So when I'm talking about homemade sauces and salsas, start where you are the fresher you can get, meaning the more homemade, not semi-homemade out of a can you can get, the healthier it's going to be for you. And that's the most important thing that I care about with regard to you and your health. I want it to be the healthiest thing that you can put into your body. So the less processed we get, of course, the healthier we typically get as well. So by making your own homemade salsas and sauces also, you avoid the number one thing that I talked about here, which is the vegetable oils. So many of our canned vegetables, even the sauces like chipotle adobo, that's a really common sauce and ingredient in some recipes in the Mexican cuisine. Chipotle adobo, it's, it's super common. It's like chipotle adobo. Everybody knows chipotle adobo. Oh my God, it's so delicious. If you've never had chipotle adobo, first, don't get it out of the can because it has all these soybean oils and I think corn syrup in it as well. I'm going to teach you how to make chipotle adobo this year because this is like, if you want to talk about a health power punch, but not only that, like your taste buds will literally just melt when they taste chipotle adobo, like smoked brisket with chipotle adobo on top. Oh my gosh. You've like died and gone to heaven when you had this. So the thing is, people don't want to take time to make chipotle adobo, which actually takes literally about 30 minutes, maybe 45. Let's give you an hour if you've never made it before. 
an hour of your time, okay, and that thing will last you probably a month if you make a batch of chipotle adobo and it stays really well in the fridge because it's made with a combination of different vinegars to help act as a preservative in the chipotle adobo. So what I'm trying to get at here is try not to be overwhelmed by the sauce or salsa, okay? Because literally these things can be really easy to make when you have the right ingredients and you have the correct directions and instructions on how to go about making the food, okay? So when you make homemade sauces, okay, if you're just starting out, I might not be so bold to start with a mole, but maybe a salsa fresca, maybe a salsa verde, okay, a green salsa, a chipotle salsa. These things, literally, you can make a salsa. All you need is, you can use fresh tomatoes. I like to use Roma tomatoes. Okay. And what I do with the Romas is I boil a pot of water. Let's just say you're making a small batch of salsa. It's going to be fresh. You, you're going to have it for you, your family, your partner, etc. Okay. Take, you know, let's say six of those Roma tomatoes, put an X on the top and an X on the bottom, pop them in the boiling water. Now you put the X on there because the skin, once they're boiled and literally you only have to have them in that water for five minutes, pull them out, the skin is going to come off, peel off just like super easy. Okay, it's going to be so tender, it's going to come right off. And so then you're just left with the tomato, the peel is off. Okay, this is the base of some of your fresh salsas. Okay, not the salsa verde, because that's a green salsa where we use things like tomatillos, maybe some poblanos. But when it comes to a fresh salsa, you can literally just go about boiling the romas in that way, okay? The skin comes off really easily, and then literally the world is your oyster. What kind of red salsa do you wanna make? You can add a little chipotle powder, a little lime, a little oregano, sea salt, of course, put that in the blender, and you're gonna have a really delicious salsa. You can use a salsa fresca, put in some cilantro, lime, oregano, put that in the blender, sea salt. I mean, these things are really easy. It literally, you can make salsas like this in a few minutes. This is going to be a really healthy way to upgrade your Mexican food experience. Eating fresh salsas and sauces, okay, these are going to be jam-packed with nutrients like vitamin C and capsicum. For those of you who don't know about capsicum, this is an element contained within peppers, okay? And so Mexican cuisine contains a boatload of different peppers, chilies, right? And so capsicum is awesome, awesome, awesome. It's anti-cancer. It's heart protective. Now, you know, we've done things like let's take capsicum out and put it in a pill. No, just eat the whole thing. Just just eat the whole chili and then you get the synergistic effects of that chili and the not only the health properties of it, but the taste of that chili is going to be really, really amazing and nourishing when you eat the whole food. Now, one of my favorite things about Mexican cuisine that I really learned about when I visited the state of Nayarit last winter is this really diverse array of salsas that are present at each meal. Literally, you sit down at the table, there's at least five salsas on the table, five different salsas. If you love Mexican cuisine and are ready to upgrade your Mexican food cooking skills, I invite you to join me for a Mexican cuisine cooking class. During these classes, you'll learn how to cook with some of the most delicious spices, chilies, cacao, and fresh ingredients that bring this delicious cuisine to life. You can sign up for a class at farmtotaco.org. Now, let's head back to the episode to learn more about my five hacks to eating healthy Mexican food. So whether you're eating meat or fish, you know, whatever the main protein is, there's literally just this diverse array of different salsas. And then you have your guac, you have your cilantro, you have your beans, you have your fresh corn tortillas. 
And this whole experience provides such diverse flavors and pleasure. And it's just a really, really satisfying way to eat. And, you know, often we're in a hurry when we're eating and there's not enough diversity. This is why we have the mac and cheese kids. They only eat mac and cheese or they'll only eat, you know, pirate booty, <laughs> you know, that, that they'll only eat one thing. We need to help these kids diverse their palate. And that starts by you as adults experiencing food and the diversity of food and you coming into your own diverse palate. When you do that, your kids will do that. My family growing up, we ate so many different foods, hot, spicy, Italian, seafood, meats, etc. And I'm so thankful for this because it really, really helped me. It just became this natural like sense that I came into this diverse palette that I love all sorts of different foods. And today we see kids and even adults, they're very, very finicky and picky regarding what they eat because they've never developed this sense of food diversity, which helps to really, really form the palate from a, a young age. If we don't form that palate from a young age, it can be more challenging to be open to doing so and experimenting and trying new foods as we get older. So I love this about the Mexican cuisine. Literally, you sit down five salsas or salsas. That number might be low, honestly, but you get this diverse array. Some one's a little sour, one's spicy, one's a little salty, one has a little sweetness to it. So you get this whole unique experience that's really, really just really pleasurable, nourishing, and it makes you want to sit down at the table for a long time. Like, I don't want to get up. This is so good. This is so nourishing. And this is also another element to Mexican cuisine that I really, really love. This diversity of different sauces and salsas. So learn to make your own common ones, chipotle and adobo, moles. Again, okay, if you're just starting out, those might be a little advanced. Start with salsa fresca. Start with a red salsa, just kind of how I outlined here for you. And if you want to learn more about how to make these, very shortly within the next month, I'll be offering some cooking classes on how to make Mexican cuisine, the salsas, the sauces, moles. We're going to get into a lot of different things, a lot of different foods with regard to Mexican cuisine, and you can check that out and stay posted by going to farmtotaco.org. That is my new additional food site specifically focusing on Mexican cuisine that is going to be released within the next week. So if you really want to learn how to do this hands-on, I'll have some virtual and in-person classes where you can learn how to eat Mexican cuisine, prepare it, fresh from scratch in your own home. Okay. So if you're into that, keep an eye out because that'll be coming up very, very, very soon. So let's go to number four, which is wild caught seafood. So depending on the region uh, where you, of Mexico, okay, Mexican food can include lots of seafood, especially if you're on a coastal region. When I was in Nayarit, Seafood was a staple. We were right on the ocean there, and the seafood was so fresh. It was literally some of the freshest seafood I've ever tasted. And one of my favorite things about visiting that part of Mexico is going to the local fish markets right on the ocean. And literally, you just go to the market, you look down the row of the vendors, and there's fresh fish for miles. I was like in heaven. I was like, oh my gosh, I need to try that one. Oh, maybe a little red snapper. Grouper, sure. Let's have that one. What about mahi mahi? Oh, of course. Smoked marlin? Absolutely. So I was like in seventh heaven. So I'm bringing this one up because a really popular food, at least here in the States and in Mexico, is fish tacos. Okay. Often, the fish in these tacos is fried. It's fried, so it's breaded with wheat often. 
and then it's fried in the vegetable oil. So we have two double whammies there, right? So when it comes to fish tacos, you can do this up in a really, really healthy way. You already learned one, make sure you got the good quality organic corn tortillas, okay? When it comes to your fish, skip the fried stuff, go for grilled, pan seared. You can use lard or leaf lard to pan sear your fish. You can use coconut oil. You can use butter, okay? Skip the vegetable oils and pan sear it in a healthy animal fat. You can use smoked fish or you can bake the fish. Baked is one of my least favorite options because it tends to be a little bit bland and flavorless. But if you're going to top on some really delicious salsas, then you want, you can, you can bring out the flavor of the salsas more by keeping the fish by not, you know, over seasoning it. I personally really love grilled fish. It gives this nice grilled, earthy, smoky flavor. And it's really, really easy to grill fish and you can do it literally in minutes. So if you don't already, get yourself a gas grill and fire it up and put on some mahi-mahi, put on some wild-caught shrimp, put on some red snapper and go to town. This is a really, really healthy way to make fish tacos. Now, we want to focus on wild-caught because the nutrient profile is much, much better than the farm raised. A lot of people are getting tricky these days, even at the farmer's market. This is a really confusing one. Have you seen this sign at your farmer's market? Organic local fish. A fish should not be organic. If it says organic, that means it was fed feed. We want the fish to be wild caught eating things from the ocean and that environment, okay? So this was really hysterical because I was at the Scottsdale Farmer's Market last weekend and I saw a sign that said, organic farmed fish, local. I said, oh, really? Tell me how that works here in, in the, Scott, the desert of Scottsdale, how we get local fish because there's not water until we get, you know, there's, there's not an ocean for days. <laughs> so we're in the middle of the desert here. There's no such thing as, as um, you know, we don't have fish here. So this is tricky. It's a tricky marketing scheme, however, because people see the word organic, they see the word local, boom, lights go off in their head. Oh, that must be a healthy product. When it comes to fish, that is a red flag. Now, if that thing were a tomato, a bunch of cilantro, uh, some chilies, a red pepper, awesome. When it comes to fish, that's a huge red flag because they were raised not in their natural environment. They were fed not their natural diet, okay? And so we want to avoid that. They're not going to have the same nutrient profile as a wild fish would. That an organic fish is not a wild fish. It's a farm-raised fish, okay? We don't want to eat farm-raised fish. Not only are they nutrient deficient, many of them have been fed soy and other processed foods and grains. These things aren't foods that fish eat, you know? Fish want plankton and things from the sea and minerals from the sea, and they need to be swimming in the salt water to get those nutrients, okay? So avoid farm-raised. If you go to a restaurant and it says salmon tacos, ask them where the salmon came from, okay? If it says fish tacos, what kind of fish and where did it come from? Today, one of the cheapest fish that is available here, at least in the States, is tilapia. That's like eating the lowest on the totem pole. Tilapia is, it's cheap, it's poorly raised, it's all farm raised. All tilapia is farm raised. There's no such thing as a wild caught tilapia, okay? You want to avoid that fish because it's one, it's been uh, by genetically engineered fish. It's not even a real wild fish. Also, fish that are wild, we're now farm raising. So things like shrimp, salmon, okay? Even things like catfish and trout, we're farm raising these things. So just because it says shrimp tacos, you want to say, hey, was that shrimp farm raised or wild caught? Because they won't tell you, they'll just say shrimp and you'll assume, or some people will anyway, 
that it's from the ocean. And so that's awesome, right? Wild caught shrimp is awesome. It's, it's one of the most nourishing foods on the planet. Farm raised fish is the opposite of that. Okay. The diet of that fish is absolutely atrocious and it's not living in its natural environment. So we want to focus on the wild caught seafood when it comes to any cuisine, but especially for the sake of this episode, when it comes to Mexican cuisine, if you're eating a dish that contains seafood, we want it to be wild caught. We want it to be wild caught because it's going to be rich in omega-3s and DHA. DHA is a fatty acid found in wild caught fish. And this is one of the important, most important molecules to the human body, to the human cell. The more DHA that you have surrounding your cell, the more energy you're going to be able to produce and the better you're going to sleep at night. So you're going to produce a lot of energy. You're going to sleep better at night. Okay. You get this nutrient from wild caught seafood. Okay. Don't think you can substitute with a supplement. I've done a lot of episodes on DHA. You cannot get the same power punch nutritionally from DHA out of a pill. This is why wild caught seafood is one of my most highly recommended foods because I consider it a high octane food. High octane because it literally puts this jet fuel, this high octane fuel into your cells and helps you to feel energized. Not only that, DHA helps to prolong your vitamin D stores. So it's a really, really important food, wild caught seafood to have in the diet. Okay. So when it comes to seafood, make sure it's wild caught before just ordering or making your fish tacos or ceviche. Ceviche is one of my favorite foods. I think I've said that a lot. It's my favorite food. It's because literally every food in this cuisine is my favorite food. So sorry about that. I'm just going to put that out there that <laughs> I might say that this one's my favorite because I literally love all of Mexican food, but ceviche can be an incredibly healthy, healthy food. It's basically ceviche. I'll break it down really quick for you, but you use some kind of wild caught fish. Traditionally, usually on the coastal regions in Mexico, they make ceviche out of shrimp. They make ceviche out of pulpo or octopus. They make ceviche out of grouper. So you take the, let's say grouper or shrimp, you know, you can use that in its raw form. So basically, pulpo, you have to cook. It requires a cooking process before you turn it into ceviche. But pulpo, oh my gosh, I'm going to say it. It's one of my favorite foods. It's literally, it's amazing. And it's a, it's one of our best dietary sources of vitamin B12. How many people are deficient in vitamin B12? Pretty much everyone on this planet today because we look at too much blue light and we don't eat enough seafood. We especially don't eat pulpo for crying out loud, right? So when you're making ceviche, and in Mexico, this is a type of ceviche, just in general, a basic term for it is aguas chiles, okay? And forgive my accent, it's atrocious. My partner, Jen, my fiance, she speaks Spanish very well. I love the language and I'm really trying to fine tune it. But don't learn from me, please. <laughs> you know, don't don't take this to, to heart too much. I'm trying here. But literally, you take a raw fish. They commonly use grouper. They use shrimp. They chop it up and you put it in this bath of lime juice. And that you let it set in the lime juice. And that lime juice literally brings this acidity into the fish, almost cooking it in a way. Okay? So anyone scared about raw fish, if you're getting this wild caught stuff right from the ocean, and then you use the lime to basically it cooks it. Okay? And so you'll see the fish literally change colors, the shrimp, the grouper, after it's sat in the lime bath for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then you start to add in the fun stuff. So then here comes some chilies, Maybe you add in some mango or pineapple and cilantro, and a lot of people use diced onion. This is a super, super delicious and nourishing dish. I often recommend ceviche to many of my clients who have cancer, especially breast cancer, because wild-caught raw fish contains some very, very healthy 
hormonal balancing elements that help to improve estrogen metabolism and neutralize any estrogenic toxins. So I love ceviche for many, many reasons. But again, that's just another way to add in wild caught seafood into your Mexican cuisine lifestyle. Okay, let's go to number five. I had to bring this one in because, well, here, you'll learn why. Number five is please stop with the raw cabbage. Okay, hear me out here. Most restaurants today, at least in the West, we put raw cabbage, especially the purple variety on top of tacos when they serve them. When I get a taco and has raw cabbage on it, I want to send that thing back. I don't want to eat it because it tells me, one, you have no idea how to make Mexican cuisine. Two, you're really cutting corners here. Raw cabbage, really? Can't we be a little bit more fun and diverse and unique than that? I mean, seriously, but people like it because it's crunchy, but they also like it because they don't know anything else. You know, what? what's really supposed to go on a taco? I'm going to tell you it's not raw cabbage. Here's the thing, okay? Although I don't like raw cabbage on tacos because it's just bland and undiverse and just there's so many better choices we could make here when it comes to flavor. Let's look at the health qualities. Raw cruciferous vegetables block iodine absorption. What's a cruciferous vegetable? Okay, it's things like cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, etc. Okay, the cruciferous vegetable family. When we eat those foods raw, it blocks iodine absorption. And iodine is a key molecule that protects against cancer and that supports healthy thyroid function and a healthy weight. Okay, so most people today in this world are already deficient in iodine and we further fuel that deficiency when we eat raw cruciferous vegetables. Iodine is one of the most important elements that the body needs to produce energy. Our cells call upon iodine to create an electrical current around our cells, okay? And this allows us to feel energized and vibrant throughout the day. The greater the electrical current around your cell, the longer you're gonna live, the more energy you're going to have, and the healthier you're going to be. So when it comes to your Mexican cuisine experience, whether it's in a taco or whatever you're eating, skip the raw cruciferous, okay? This is like an American trend, and we've been convinced that eating raw foods is healthy in our culture. More often than not, a diet centered around raw foods isn't ideal for many reasons especially if we're not living in a tropical environment, okay? But the foods that we eat in the raw state here in the West are typically not, not even the foods that are healthy when eaten raw, okay? Raw cruciferous vegetables, raw cacao, raw chocolate, raw nuts, raw seeds. These things should never be eaten raw because of their anti-nutrient properties, okay? And this includes raw cruciferous also spinach. A lot of people, oh, let me have a spinach salad. That's like a disaster for nutrient malabsorption in your gut. So skip the raw spinach, skip the raw cruciferous veggies, take the more traditional and healthy way to eat tacos, eat Mexican cuisine, and focus on fresh salsas, your fresh guacamole, fresh chopped cilantro, and those healthy, delicious salsas, okay? I hope you enjoyed this episode all about upgrading your Mexican food experience. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much to all of you who tuned into the episode today all about upgrading your Mexican cuisine experience. For those of you ready to dive into authentic, healthy, and delicious Mexican food, I invite you to visit farmtotaco.org to learn more about my Mexican cuisine cooking classes and homemade Mexican chocolates and chilies available for purchase on that site. Both in-person and virtual cooking classes will be available very soon this 2021. For those of you who enjoyed this episode, I would love for you to post a five-star review with your comments and support. This is such an amazing way to fuel and motivate my continued podcasting and sharing via this platform. And it's a super great way to help spread the word to others searching for deeper answers around their health. I thank you so much for that support. As always, you can follow me on Instagram at sunlight underscore RX or on Facebook, Heather Shepard. And visit me on my site, heathershepard.com where my metabolic reset course, recipes, 
and Radical Health blog are all located. Keep up the awesome healing work, everyone, and see you soon. The Primal Pioneer podcast is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any disease in the Western medical sense or terms. It is to be used for educational and informational purposes only. The information shared on this podcast and all of Heather Shepard's work is not a form of diagnostic medicine, nor is it a medical treatment. Heather Shepard is a health educator, radical health practitioner, and a trained EMF specialist. And although she has a bachelor's in science and master's education in alternative medicine, she is not a medical doctor and does not give medical advice. Her work and sharing is to be used for informational and educational purposes only. 